Good morning, Tom in California and the other panelists around the world. Uh, hello uh, to the visitors on the screen whenever and wherever you watch it. Welcome to the first eFlight Expo panel discussion at Aero 2020. As you know, the Aero 2020 has been, like many other events, cancelled due to the coronavirus. But over the last years, the panel discussions at the eFlight Expo at Aero has been a highlight of the show and packed with information and news from the electric world, from Volocopter over Siemens, Uber Elevate, and many others. We want to keep this tradition and inform you as possible online now about the latest news in electric aviation. The first panel, which we will have, is about the core of electric aviation, the propulsion system. So welcome with me, our guests, which are Olaf Otto, Rolls-Royce Electrical, Tom Gunnarsson, Whisker Aero and ASTM, Konstantin Kondak, Electra UAS, Uwe Kieswetter from Airbus City Airbus, and me, it's Willy Tucker from eFlight Expo. And okay, good. Then uh, I would ask um, perhaps Olaf, as we talk about motors, and Olaf is representing a manufacturer of uh, electric motors for aviation. Uh, give us a short update of what Rolls-Royce is doing and planning and where you are with the certification for electric motor systems. Um, so, um, basically, we have, a, um, we have an engine that is currently in the uh, process of certification with EASA um, and in concurrent certification with the FAA. We started the activities to have um, the engine certified now um, in terms of starting the discussions and registering the, the, the type certificate last year. Um, and we've made um, qu quite a bit of progress. We started to um, uh, basically look at a certification um, under CS23. Um, and the aim was to certify the, the engine under CS23 ELA1. Um, so the simplest category of, um, of CS23, if you will. Um, we've, we've gone through a number of different iterations and discussions. We're currently now at a stage where the TC has been registered. Um, we are actually running the certification um, under CSE um, with a concurrent certification um, still uh, in the US with the FAA. The means of compliance are in the um, in, in discussion and um, we're hoping to finalize those um, by the by the summer um, and um, then the, 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 the process of certification can start and however long that um, in, takes us in the end um, you know, we're quite hopeful to have that um, ready in the next few years we're not um, doing that completely in the in, in, in kind of the in, in empty space um, we're working together with um, by aerospace um, in, in this instance um, uh, because we're trying to align with them. They are um, currently using the, um, the engine um, and um, they are also in the process of running a certification program for their aircraft and they will use then the type um, certificated um, engine from our side as part of their overall aircraft. TC. Um, the um, the uh, w one interesting point um, I think is in terms of the uh, the scope of the type certificate. So um, the, the the focus for the for the type certificate from our side is the um, is the electrical machine um, plus the inverter and controller, and that for us is kind of the smallest box that um, you can have as a meaningful type certificate, and that's what we've entered for the uh, for the type certificate from our side. There are many different um, discussions that are ongoing at the moment in terms of could you have this um, also, um, or, or should you include other components in a, in, a, in a type certificate? And there's some people that are considering to enter um, the whole system, including the battery. Um, in, in, in the type certificate for the engine um, 
and, and uh, I, th I think there's the, 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 the different schools of thought on that one at the moment. Um, fact is that the authorities have accepted the um, argument of having the engine um, as a motor, inverter, and uh, controller. Um, uh, what, 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 what else can I, can, can I highlight? I think that's interesting. Um, we've, um, it's, it's, there, there is a, there's a significant amount of, um, system impact that comes onto the motor, of course, because in the end, if you build the engine, um, it is not completely like, um, a, um, like a, like a combustion engine that kind of sits by itself in the front, but if you if you take the approach of saying we, we want to look at motor and inverter, you need to consider the interplay between the um, be, be, between that part of the overall system plus then uh, the battery and the fault propagation throughout the system. So th that that plays quite a significant part in terms of how you then define uh, the interfaces. But um, we've so far um, actually been. Um, quite positively encouraged in terms of being able to um, segregate these 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 parts and the different components in the systems and make that uh, make that work. Um, we we we're, our plan is to continue with the with the certification of the of of this kind of smallest um, type certificate um, uh, the the EPU type certificate. Um, we are. Um, currently working on plans to extend this and to ensure that we then can offer the full systems as well in a certified way um, that's a little bit uh, further off from a timeline point of view um, and at the same time um, we have set up some additional programs um, uh, this year to um, then uh, provide the uh, product uh, type versions both for the um, urban air mobility um, engines, um, uh, kind of focusing on lift motors, um, and we have a, a, a second program that is focused on providing the engines for higher power classes, commuter-sized engines that would be um, CS23 um, uh, up, up to CS23 ELA4. Um, now those those programs. Um, are um, on, on, a, on a longer time frame. Um, we're not going to have the um, type certification, type certificated version of those engines available in the next few years. Um, it'll take a bit longer, um, but um, I think especially what we've what we've learned through the um, through the process so far in terms of taking the smaller engine, um, the seventy ninety sub one hundred kilowatt. Um, type of engine through the through the process. Um, I think that's going to be very informative um, for for everything um, that we're that we're doing there. Um, yeah, I think that's 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 kind of a, the high level overview. Any any questions from anybody? I, I think let's do. I, I suggest let's do the following: that perhaps everybody makes his presentation either with or without slides, and then we have the questions from everybody in the end, like real panel, panel discussion. So um, I would suggest uh, as we started with one of the beginners uh, on the uh, aviation, on the propulsion system side, it would be great if you, Tom, could give us an overview over uh, what uh, you have been involved from the beginning to uh, electric propulsion. You're in aviation. We know us more than 25 years, I think. Uh, so now, uh, what has been the development in the A on the ASTM side? And perhaps you also can explain how the ASTM actually got into this field of um, of aviation certification. What is role? It's they are the FAA, the EASA. But what is ASTM doing there around the world? Thanks, Willie. Uh, so to to start at the <clears throat> the macro level, we have the um, regulatory requirements for which, in developing some of these new technologies, there have been uh, gaps in the regulations <clears throat> because they didn't really envision some of the technology we have today. So the um, authorities are um, having to consider what would be appropriate 
uh, requirements for things like electric motors and um, a lot of the other systems that are going into some of these aircraft that nobody's really uh, thought about before. And in that, uh, at the same time, there's been um, uh, an opportunity to convert some of the regulatory requirements from very prescriptive rules, which were based on what was known at the time the rules were written, to more performance-based rules, which then um, speak specifically to the, the aspects of uh, things in a more generic way. So for instance, when we talk about engines, we would normally think about uh, piston and turbine engines when it comes to regulatory requirements. Electric motors are very different in that respect. Mm -hmm. And by going to performance-based regulations, then you can talk about uh, something more generically like a power plant or a propulsion system and then allow for <clears throat> the means of compliance to define what sort of uh, testing may need to, to take place or analysis to show that whatever that is, is uh, meets the regulatory requirements. So in the case of uh, Part 23 and, and CS23, that process has taken place at the regulatory level to create uh, performance-based regulations. And it's slowly seeping into other areas. Uh, so for instance, with, with uh, Part 33 or CSE, um, there we still have those very prescriptive requirements, which are based on whether you have a piston engine or a turbine engine. And uh, the regulators have, have seen that the best path forward in the short term, uh, because rulemaking takes so long, is to come up with uh, special conditions, which would allow the, an applicant to uh, come to the authority um, based on what uh, the authority thinks is, is generally the right direction for those things which aren't covered under the current regulations. So there's been a lot of work on the industry side to help make sure that there are some uh, means of compliance that are uh, generally agreed to. Um, that helps everyone. Uh, <clears throat> the authorities would prefer not to have to go through this process individually with every applicant that comes along, especially since there are so many players in this new field. And so there's been quite a bit of work, <clears throat> both with the authorities and the industry together to try to create some uh, consensus standards where possible to help in assuring that what the authority thinks are reasonable special conditions, meaning the regulatory requirements, uh, there can be some known uh, ways to comply with it. So. Uh, FA and EASA take a little different approaches. Um, EASA is much more open in their uh, approach in that they're, they're coming up with uh, proposed uh, special conditions that are relatively generic in scope. And they're, they're actually, uh, there's currently um, a, I uh, uh, forgot what it's called. Um, the special condition case, electric propulsion units. Yeah, so there's a there's a proposal out right now for comment from YASA yep. uh, on their special condition, which they've published, uh, so that the industry can and anybody else for that matter can can provide some input toward what that would uh, end up looking like, so that especially for applicants, they know ahead of time uh, pretty much what to expect. Uh, FA takes a little different approach; they like to do it. Um, on a case-by-case -case basis because they feel that there's so much variety in what applicants are coming with that um, they really don't feel comfortable with uh, codifying at this point uh, one way to do it. So <clears throat> uh, that's not so visible uh, to the uh, rest of the community, but there are applicants in process who are already working that as we just heard from uh, uh, all of that are beginning to flesh out 
what that might look like. So in the background, um, what's happening is that in particular, FA and EASA are working very closely together to try to um, make sure that there are, if there are differences between their approach to what those requirements should look like, they're very small. And that then feeds down to those of us who are working on uh, the standards that could be used to show a means of compliance to those. So for instance, um, today we have uh, an ASTM standard, F3338, if you want to look it up, <clears throat> for electric propulsion uh, means of compliance to what everybody is kind of guessing a little bit will be the special conditions from both FA and EASA. So it's a little chicken and egg as far as how the process works. But the main thing is that the authorities and, and industry are working very closely together to try to um, make sure that there aren't any significant gaps in uh, either the, the regulation or regulatory language or the means of compliance. Uh, and a lot of this is driven by, uh, well, the, the big issue is that because this is all new, there's not a lot of data to work with to confirm what the best approach is. And so that um, means that there has to be a, a little bit of, um, uh, I guess I'll say faith in what is being provided to show uh, that a, an applicant can get through this process. So there's uh, multiple uh, standards groups working on different areas uh, in helping with this. Uh, everything from the, the propulsion system to all the components, uh, all the way through charging of batteries, things like that. Um, and that's ongoing, that, that will just continue to, to go. And there's, uh, so I, I think of uh, uh, some of those groups, RTCA, SAE, ASTM, um, and there's, there's an UPJARS, uh, uh, you're okay. All these groups are working toward helping provide this kind of information. And I think I'll leave it at that, Willie, because that probably will create enough questions later. Yes. So, okay, then now we heard about the regulatory side. We heard about the motor side. So perhaps we would go now, perhaps, Constantine, perhaps you could give us first the applicant side of somebody who builds an aircraft and wants to use an electric aircraft and where you are we're on the certification side. I know that at the beginning with Electrosolar, you started with the, on the ultralight side of an ultralight aircraft. Please uh, give us an update, share your screen, and uh, then we will have more questions, I'm, I'm sure, later. Okay. So, just a second. So, can you see the screen? I see it perfectly. Okay, good. So, so first, uh, thank you very much. Yeah. It's a pleasure for me here to make this introduction to our current state. So unfortunately, my colleague, uh, Colin Gologan, who's supposed to give uh, this presentation is not here, yeah. Um, so my role in uh, the company Electrosolar is uh, uh, everything uh, uh, connected to electric, electronics, uh, autopilot, yeah. So, um, but uh, in today I will give uh, overall presentation yeah, of, of where we are at the moment and what are the next plans, yeah, in the sense you introduced. Uh, so, uh, just a second. So we just, uh -huh. Good. Um, as you know, we started with Electra 1. This was uh, uh, a work of uh, Kalin. Uh, with this uh, small aircraft uh, and um, uh, it is in a flight operation since 2011, yeah. Uh, 2015 we had uh, a demonstration flight over the Alps and uh, now we are working on uh, this aircraft uh, towards different applications, yeah. So you can see here 
uh, on the image uh, aircraft, uh, which is equipped with a camera, with a high resolution camera, we can take images and then uh, do the pre-processing on board and transmit the images um, to the ground uh, or uh, save uh, these high resolution images and uh, reconstruct 3D models of uh, the environments. Yeah. So here we are uh, on the next level. So we think that uh, uh, this uh, type of aircrafts uh, are more or less developed to this level of development. And uh, now we are focused here on uh, the developing of uh, applications yeah, based on this aircraft. So um, then uh, we have also a larger aircraft, Electra 2. Uh, it's uh, around 30 meters wingspan and uh, also heavier up to uh, 5,000 kilogram. Uh, here, uh, the main uh, goal is uh, to um, develop the systems, uh, solar electric also. Here we have an additional component, a solar uh, generator and uh, to go with this aircraft uh, to the higher altitudes. Yeah? So we are talking about missions uh, at the altitude of uh, up to 20, 25 kilometers. And the idea is uh, to stay on uh, this altitude, uh, uh, theoretically, theoretically, unlimited time. Yeah, during the days, uh, we can recharge the batteries. And uh, during the night, we can uh, go a little bit down, yeah, but uh, stay nevertheless at the significant altitudes. Yeah. So uh, here uh, we started with uh, uh, aircraft, uh, which uh, was uh, provided to the project uh, Solar Stratos. Yeah, this is on the top uh, of the image. Uh, and uh, uh, here's the second image uh, shows uh, the flight uh, uh, at the altitude of 10 kilometers. Uh, but um, in this case, we have uh, unmanned version. Yeah? So actually, we operate this aircraft, Electro 1 and Electro 2, in these uh, combinations uh, with a pilot uh, supported by uh, autopilot in so-called optionally piloted mode. And we also operate this aircraft as a pure UIV. Yeah? So, and in uh, this uh, second example, we have a pure uh, UIV version of the aircraft and uh, it's a flight at the altitude of 10 kilometers. Yeah, here uh, we work in parallel. We uh, have been improving the aircraft and still working on uh, new modifications to make it lighter, uh, to increase uh, um, uh, the um, uh, possibility to stay uh, on higher altitudes. And of course, we are looking here also in parallel to the applications yeah, and uh, applications. Uh, actually, here we are talking about uh, the same applications we have uh, with the satellites, yeah. So it's also clear uh, that uh, uh, such a solar electric platform is much cheaper. So now we can also talk from our own experience about the costs, yeah. Um, that uh, uh, using this aircraft, uh, we can provide more or less the same, uh, or I would say up to 90% of uh, the services which uh, have uh, been providing now by the satellites, but we can reduce the cost uh, by uh, one order. We also we are not talking about two times. We can say here 10 times cheaper, uh, the better quality of the data because the distance to the uh, Earth surface is uh, 20 kilometers here yeah, compared to uh, several hundred kilometers in case of uh, uh, satellites, so we have also much better resolution of the sensors here. Yeah. And of course, we can uh, land this aircraft, perform the maintenance, and then start again. Yeah, exchange the sensor payload. Yeah, it's a, a really uh, interesting direction uh, here, yeah, um, which uh, uh, we follow. And I think it could be, uh, yeah, like a new uh, revolution in communication techniques and also in. Uh, applications um, uh, connected to some kind of observations. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, 
uh, our current uh, status uh, with these aircrafts. And uh, I go further uh, to this project, uh, Electra 10. Uh, it's a small uh, aircraft for 10 passengers. This is uh, uh, a cooperation uh, project uh, uh, or this project belongs uh, to Skylux, um, but uh, the shares of uh, Skylux uh, are owned by Eatco and Electrosoro. Also, um, other companies, one airline, and uh, is uh, part of uh, this uh, project. Uh, so here uh, we have a vision uh, to connect uh, some suburban areas with uh, cities and with uh, airports. Um, we don't have uh, now, or we, we didn't put on the slides additional images um, with a special takeoff and landing system uh, based uh, on a moving platform. So we would like uh, to uh, be able to start uh, uh, this aircraft from, uh, from a simple field. Uh, uh, so we don't need uh, some uh, uh, installations here, just some preliminary preparations and the aircraft can uh, start to take off and land, yeah? So good, uh, the weight is around 3,500 3, kilograms. Uh, and uh, what we um, uh, would like uh, also to introduce to the system is so-called one pilot operation, yeah? So uh, equipped with a uh, full functional autopilot, yeah, we would like uh, to reduce the cost of operation by having only one pilot in the cockpit, yeah. So this, uh, 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 the project uh, uh, is in uh, the uh, status of, uh, so the status of the project is a pre-design is finished. So we are now looking for uh, financing to build uh, a first prototype of this aircraft. And uh, on uh, the uh, last two slides, I would just uh, talk about uh, the certification plans uh, uh, which we have now. So we are in the process, or better to say, we are about to finish a certification of Electra 1. Uh, for ultralight uh, German uh, rules. Uh, the propulsion system, uh, uh, we will um, certify uh, for ASTM standards and uh, later based on this preliminary work, uh, we would uh, like to go for uh, CSLSA, the other certification for uh, Electra 2, yeah, so. So in the last slide, some more details to uh, the development of the propulsion system. Um, uh, we are talking here about uh, uh, power ranges, ranges of up to 50 kilowatt, yeah. Uh, so we started to work with uh, Geiger Engineering, with Joachim Geiger, uh, many years ago. Uh, more than 10 years ago, even the very first uh, aircraft, uh, Electro One, was equipped with this engine. Uh, and after some time, we decided uh, to go uh, together with him into the development. So now it's a joint project uh, between uh, Geiger Engineering, uh, a German Airspace Center, and Electro Solar. And um, we um, have been developing here a special type of engines um, or propulsion systems which uh, are able to fly also at the very high altitude. Yeah, we have many challenges there. Uh, the uh, huge temperature range, we are talking about uh, plus uh, 40 up to minus 90 degrees. Yeah, and of course, uh, the highest possible effici efficiency is uh, uh, requested here. Uh, under propulsion system, uh, we understand uh, motor, motor controller, battery with battery management system, uh, solar converter, and uh, solar generator. So everything together is a propulsion system, and on all the components, uh, yeah, we have been heavily working 
uh, in the last uh, uh, two years and uh, we hope this year to have the possibility to uh, uh, test uh, the very new version on the altitude of 20 kilometers. Yeah, this is a completely double redundant system. We have uh, two motors, two sets of batteries, two motor controllers, yeah, two uh, solar generators and two solar converters. So everything is doubled. And uh, the idea is uh, uh, also uh, not only to equip our equipment, uh, our aircrafts with this equipment, but also uh, to sell uh, the propulsion system or components as uh, standalone products. Yeah? So this is a short um, introduction in what is going on in this area yeah, in our company. Okay, thank you very much. I already have some questions, but I keep it until we have heard the last presentation. Uwe, so perhaps you can give us uh, your update on where Airbus is with electric with the electric activities, especially on the point of view with the different activities and the, so on the on the certification side, especially of the propulsion system, because you're using. We're talking now. We talked about uh, fixed wing aircraft. Now we go to the field of urban air mobility. Yes, correct. Um, wait a second. I will share the presentation. Yes. It's coming. Okay. Yeah. So now I will focus uh, a lot on, on our city Airbus Alpha and give a little bit an out uh, way ahead what what we uh, you know what we will do next. Uh, but first of all, I, I want to show a little bit the status of, of, of what we did in, in our city Airbus Alpha activities, since this is a big driver for for our next generation aircrafts. Um, this is a big driver for our um, specifications, requirements, uh, and then in the end, um, also certifications and things or activities. Uh, here you see a little bit of timeline for, for our current um, Project so City Airbus Alpha it is flown um, end by end of last year for first time, uh, and here you see a lot of things we did um, mainly focusing on um, the electric propulsion system. So we started here in in um, 27 or 2017 with um, development testing of um, of our propulsion system uh, with the propellers. Um, then you know there was the um, dysfunction and equation test bench where we had um, the motors, inverters, um, batteries in the loop. Uh, this test was mainly used for qualification, not for not for certification. Um, so far it was mainly used for qualification. Um, and then in 2019 we we entered in uh, in our ground, ground and flight test phase. Um, you know this was um, our Propulsion system. This was a cooperation. Um, Olaf, you know it pretty well um, with you, um, Siemens, and um, now Rolls Royce. Um, we are still in this, you know, qualification of flight test um, phase. Uh, maybe to give you a little bit an overview, what is um, what is in here in the city Airbus Alpha, or what was the approach? Um, why we why we have um, started the project? Um, it was very concentrating on this multi-copter architecture and it was uh, meant as a quick proof of concept. Um, we, in terms of, are we able to control this kind of aircraft? Uh, multi-copter is full size and full size and full weight. Um, and we have concentrated a lot on, on an architecture, safety architecture of all the systems, which is close to, um, to a, and later, close to a product, I would say, but not not from a not from a qualification standpoint, but from a function and architecture standpoint. Um, yeah, the the rest, I guess, it's it's um, as relatively known since it's um, there are some uh, some official videos um, existing. Um, so, you know, this is a multi-copter architecture. We have eight um, propellers, um, so therefore also eight EPUs. Um, we have a propeller which is turning relatively at relatively low um, tip speed. So therefore, this is a, a, a big challenge for the motors. Uh, they need a lot of torque. Um, they are, you know, this is an RPM controlled aircraft. So therefore, you have to um, change the RPM 
quite often. Uh, so therefore, this is a big challenge here for the EPU, for the batteries, for the distribution system. Uh, this is here um, a, a bigger, uh, a bigger model of the aircraft. Uh, you see there is a cooling system uh, installed on the aircraft. Um, so it's, it was designed for 35 degree atmospheric temperature. Uh, there is a distribution distribution system which um, allows to distribute the energy from four batteries to eight motors, um, and it can handle a lot of uh, a lot of failure scenarios. Um, <clears throat> the inverters and the EPUs, so the um, eight motors, um, eight inverters. This is what we call EPU on our side. <clears throat> here to give you some um, milestones and an outlook. So you see here there was a flight last year. We had uh, some a couple of flights um, this year as well. Um, this is quite interesting. So in last year we had in the summer break, we had a, a first need for system upgrade since um, in the ground test phase and ground run phase, we have figured out uh, that we have, that we need to upgrade some systems. And this, uh, there, there you see already that, that we are quite at the beginning of our, um, of our journey. So it's really a lot of things to do. Uh, since now here, it's not only the motor, not the electrical system, it's also a new aircraft type of aircraft. Uh, and therefore, I guess if you, if we ask um, ourselves if you are ready for certification, I would answer yes in, in terms of architecture, capabilities and functions, since this was already demonstrated, but maybe not in terms of certification rules, um, safety aspects and standards, since they are, you know, they are now starting to uh, to, to be established uh, from really top level, um, aircraft level, and then down to, to APU uh, or electrical system level. Um, and I guess on the on our side, really we we focus a lot on the on the um, aircraft level first, and then derive all the specification environments afterwards. Um, so therefore, this was a little bit my answer here for uh, ready for certification. Um, yeah, that that that's it from a okay. from my presentation. So yeah, thanks. I would. Uh, I have some questions. Perhaps if somebody of the other panelists has some questions, uh, I'll leave you first to uh, to ask your questions. Um, otherwise, uh, I would start with my ones. Okay, then perhaps let me start with a question. Just following the last presentation of Uber and. Um, when you talk about you, you know talk about the certification you have the motor would you think that you would rather certify the aircraft with a propulsion system as a unit or you would have a certified aircraft and then have different certified propulsion units where you could choose one or the other like it is like for example if you have an airbus you have the airbus certification and then you have, you can use rolls royce turbines or GE turbines or other turbines uh, where the turbine itself is certified or the same in general aviation. Very often you have a certified airframe and then a, an air engine with a TC. Would this a way or would you think with the complexity of an electric propulsion system, you would rather have the propulsion system certified with the aircraft? <coughs> You know, I guess it's at the moment it's quite open. So this uh, is a discussion which is also ongoing in Airbus. Um, since you, as you said, it's quite you know it's very complex. Since you you have now a, a, a big a big um, a, you know correlation or a big link between EPU, then your the choice of your of your aircraft um, concept of your architecture and then safety aspects. So um, in my opinion, you know. Um, a lot of com components they are linked to to each other, and therefore, my it's I guess it's not so easy to answer like on an airplane or on an airliner. Um, so we, we go through now. This is our um, current um, or our actual work. We go through really the entire system, and we figure out uh, what is the what is the uh, what is the interaction between all the systems, uh, and we see quite a big interaction between EPU topology, uh, EPU capability, the propellers, and the choice of, of, um, of the architecture. 
therefore it's 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 a quite challenging um, question sorry i cannot answer fully to, to it at the moment since we are we are really in a in a in a process where we go through it but um, maybe olaf you can uh, you can also give your standpoint here if it's really um, if it if we could be able to 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 isolate um, the aircraft and the EPU, or if it's alre always um, a combination? I mean, I, I think from my point of view, um, especially if you look at, if you, if, if you look at the complex um, VTOLs, then um, th there's, there's a much greater degree of interaction between the, um, between the EPU and the aircraft than I think before. You know, the, the, um, just the the level of integration is is more complex because we have um, we, we have a greater amount of um, uh, a greater amount of uh, interaction between the, the way that the airframe is set up and, and and where you place certain components and, and and how you connect them. So I think the interplay between the um, airframe maker and the engine maker. Um, becomes more significant. Um, on the other hand, I think with a um, with a with a very good um, uh, way of describing and 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 uh, simulating the system itself, I think you're then able to really describe um, uh, the, the 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 requirements that. You need to have for the various system components to quite to quite a good degree, but on the other hand, um, there's 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 so much there's so many specialities involved in all these topics that I think the optimal result you can only really achieve if you work really really closely together um, in in all the various disciplines. Yeah, correct. I mean, we have to align really and harmonize our interfaces, which is quite tough on, 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 on this kind of aircraft, since you don't have one interface, you have a lot of things and safety yeah. aspects also, they are interfering a lot. So therefore, we have to, to work much more together, I guess, um, yes. uh, on both on both sides. Yeah. There would be one follow-up question on this because like Olaf, now you said there is even more, more interaction between the EPU and the, and the aircraft. But uh, you said that at the first place, you're going for a certification of inverter motor and not even the battery. Uh, uh, so then there is, a, again, because there is also this very strong interaction between the motor propulsion system uh, and the battery. So at this point, I don't think there is any common interface which would define uh, how the, uh, the battery has to interact with the motor. So um, would then be a, a, like a motor which is where only the motor is certified be useful for an airframe manufacturer because then he would have to go very deep into uh, the battery or are there companies which are offering just the batteries? So I, I think would it be useful? Absolutely 100%. So, um, in, in, in any in any certified system, the the ICD interface control documentation is, is is vital. You need to know how to connect the system. You need to know how the system behaves if you have certain um, uh, connectivities. I think the more important point is that uh, the, the 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 question is how much flexibility remains for um, the uh, for, for for the for the producers and the manufacturers other systems and I think this is this is the key point so um, to, 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 to take to take a, a, a random example if you if you want if you need to have um, a certain safety aspect like being able to disconnect a current carrying component to disconnect a current carrying wire um, if you have as part of the system architecture defined that this is not inside the scope of the uh, of, of say the motor the inverter and controller then by definition you need to have that somewhere else inside the electrical system inside the electrical distribution system so the degrees of freedom for the uh, remainder of the system are then curtailed you can't just decide anything and that's um, I think the, the the important point if you de if you design and develop something um, it will have a certain 
Um, it'll have certain safety considerations. It'll have certain failure cases. Um, and it'll have an, an idea in terms of how reliability is considered. And that then has to work inside the remainder of the system. And um, I think you're able to create quite a, um, qu quite a good basis, but you're probably not going to have something that then just works in any combination of, of, of systems. Having said that, you know, you can't, you know, you, you can't use a, a gas turbine for a, for, for, for a, for, for an A320, for a helicopter. So those are also different systems. So, you know, that we were in kind of, it's still, still, still in the same domain, but the number of interfaces is there. You need to manage them and you need to describe them. Uh, one question, which would be also follow up on this to Tom. Do, are you aware that ASTM is working in defining this kind of interfaces? Because I think they are vital when you later say you have different manufacturers, different component manufacturers, if they should work together and not everything has to be defined again. Um, are there uh, initiatives for defining this standard? For example, the standard connecting between the, uh, the inverter and the motor or the standard connecting between the motor controller and the battery system? So I think right now um, that's not a, a current effort that's going on uh, for any of the specific standards that uh, are in development now, uh, other than there, there may be some of those where you get into specific uh, connections. Uh, SAE is really good at developing standards for smaller components like that, where they might describe a, a system and, and where you'd want to have uh, commonality. But I think that until some of the, um, these projects uh, come to fruition and it gets understood what works well, um, especially when you consider we're dealing with some pretty high power um, connections, which I, I don't think is uh, too typical, at least on the smaller uh, scale aircraft. You get into the, the big ones and they might be already dealing with that. And there may already be some standards that, that would cover some of that. Uh, but it, in terms of having a one-stop shop where you could find a standard that would cover all of the integration um, I'm not sure we're going to see that. The other part is that it just in, um, as was just described, if you're going to have a propulsion system that's being integrated into an aircraft, there's already quite a bit of uh, information that talks to that when it comes to how you would comply to regulatory requirements. I think of uh, in ASTM, there are uh, standards that are developed for uh, Part 23 or CS23 aircraft for which there are, uh, there's already quite a bit of discussion about uh, integration requirements. Uh, they're a bit generic though, and I think what you're talking about, Willie, is you know, can you go somewhere where it says, use this kind of connector or yes. uh, something like that. I, I think it's more, um, you know, make sure it's safe and you need to prove your case, uh, right. which is going to be on more of a case-by-case -case basis. Uh -huh. Right. And um, as you talked about high voltage, I think high voltage is a key factor, especially when we have things like uh, Constantine, you mentioned your aircraft is, you already have been flying up to 10,000 meters. So flying at 10,000 meters, I think it's very difficult to know how this would work with, very, with high voltages. How do you uh, cover this? And the same question later to um, Olaf, uh, because when you want to do later commuter engines, the aircraft must and the propulsion system must be capable to work even in 10,000 meters. The air density and everything is very different. So also the electric reactions could be different. Are there already tests being made? So perhaps first Constantine and then Olaf. Okay, so short answer to your question, uh, Will. Yeah, it's very simple. Uh, we don't use uh, high voltage, yeah? So this is, <laughs> we use uh, currently so 60 volt uh, uh, system on our um, aircrafts and uh, the reason is not um, a problem with high altitudes, the reason is uh, just that we are a small company and we would like to um, organize our work uh, in a, a 
a very economic way. Yeah? So having a 60 volt, um, as uh, all of you know, it's uh, very easy to handle yeah, in the production process. So, and this is the reason why uh, we stay with this uh, 60 volt uh, technology. Yeah? So, um, okay, good. This is a short uh, question, a short answer to this. Uh, question, uh, perhaps a comment to general uh, problem, um, high voltage and uh, high altitude. So uh, to be honest, I don't think that it is uh, really an issue here. Yeah, uh, you could, um, so this is a phenomena of uh, uh, high altitude, so this change of the atmosphere, for this uh, question, type of question is understood very well, so I don't see a problem to make a system also with uh, 400 volts, yeah, which will be reliable on a higher attitude. So, yeah, uh, I, I would like to, to, to give a very short uh, yeah. comment also to this um, uh, uh, point with the certification, yeah, so if you have to certify a complete uh, electrical propulsion unit or uh, in the components, uh, so actually the certification process uh, um, is composed naturally of, uh, I would say, uh, separate consideration of each component, yeah, because a battery system is uh, completely, uh, something completely different for a motor controller, yeah, so, and of course, uh, at the end uh, you have a specification for a complete system, but in the design uh, process you consider each component separately, yeah, and uh, mm -hmm. To my opinion, uh, the issue is here, or the difficulty is not to define which type of physical connections we should have. Uh, the issue, so this is one of the issues, but more complicated issue is here uh, to align um, uh, uh, the uh, specifications of each component. For example, yeah, if I have a motor from Rolls Royce, yeah and the battery system for Siemens, it could be the peak current for a motor uh, of Rolls-Royce uh, system is defined in such a way that it does not uh, really comply with the uh, uh, battery system. Yeah? So this uh, internal parameters of uh, each device, uh, they should be aligned with each other. And I see here a difficulty yeah? because as everybody knows, if you connect uh, yeah, the components together could be some a surprising effects, yes, yeah? so, and uh, how to make a standard that everything is considered in the interface document, uh, it uh, seems to me be uh, one of the challenges here. Okay, um, uh, Olaf, I still would like to ask you the question as, uh, as you were talking in the, especially in the bigger engines, of even much higher than 400 voltage where you're gonna be going for the large. So I, and what I understand from talking with uh, different people, there is, or there are some things which still have to be evalu uh, evaluated when you're talking about having 2000 volts in about 10,000 meters that nobody knows exactly how the reaction in this area would be with a different air density. Um, I mean, I think I, I think you I think you're right that there's a lot of that there's a lot of development work that's still needed. Um, so we have we, we have programs running, developing um, systems um, both in the um, in, in the in the lower um, voltage range. Um, so um, sort of 400 to 800 up to you know, just above um, one kilovolt. And then on the systems for the large airplanes, you know, going up to three kilovolts and beyond. Um, a, a, lot of, a, a, lot of the, a lot of the topics still need engineering work. You know, how do you, how do you build out the contactors? How do you work with the isolation? How do you, how do you ensure that partial uh, discharges are being handled. Um, how do you ensure a graceful degradation of the system because you might not be able to avoid it completely? Um, I don't think any of it is unsurmountable. Um, it's but it's some some heavy engineering work that needs to be done. Uh, we know today that we can fly 
systems in the kind of 400 um, ish, 400, 500 volt range, we can fly quite comfortably. Um, and I think um, sort of in the, in the, in the coming the next few years, we'll see systems that um, sit at the one kilovolt that that will be that will be out there and will work. Um, and as Constantine says, the systems have to work together. So um, you know, it, it's it's no good for me if I've designed the um, the the inverter and and the motor to work with a uh, with a DC link of uh, a kilovolt, and then I have a battery that comes and only gives me 400 volts. You know, that's that's not gonna that's not gonna cut it. So um, we need to be able to to have those that that flexibility. Fortunately, on the battery side, at least. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're able to size the batteries um, uh, through, you know, your parallel and serial arrangements um, uh, quite effectively. So that's that's a, a good um, that that's a good design tool that exists in a sense or design freedom. Uh, the complication, of course, then comes on the battery side. How, please make sure that this this great new arrangement of cells that you've made uh, is now is, is now safe and that. I'm not going to have problems uh, when, uh, God forbid, some kind of error occurs. So the, a lot of tricky engineering work. Okay, thank you for the answer. And I see from the time-wise, it's always it's nearly like with the normal panel discussions. We always at the end, uh, the time is running short. I know I asked you only for one hour, and I think one hour is also good for the people to to visit. I I just have one final question to Uwe. And then I would uh, leave you with your home office or office work, which is quite difficult in those, in those days. Uh, Uwe, you mentioned uh, you talk mainly about the um, about the, the city Airbus and about all the propulsion systems we work. So we all know that Airbus is working on different projects in this field on the UAM area. So uh, would you? Uh, um, can we expect any other Airbus uh, eVTOL coming soon? Uh, <laughs> or uh, if, uh, and this again, will this be then in the same field, like the same size of aircraft? And uh, would this then be a project which already is going for a product being certifiable? Uh, with the pro propulsion system, or would this more be another demonstrator of technology? Like you had the Vahana for the winged aircraft, you had the just uh, rotor lift aircraft, which is a city Airbus. Um, can you give some little light up here? <laughs> wow, this is a, a huge question. Thanks a lot. Um, we <clears throat> You know, we are now in our definition phase for what could be a next uh, a next um, project. Uh, and well, in terms of size, I guess we we are quite we are quite there. So what we have seen is that the size of the aircraft is more or less what you need when you um, want to carry three or four persons. Uh, so I don't speak about an um, ultralight or a one one passenger aircraft. I speak really about um, three to four persons, and there we see that the size of um, city Airbus is is quite uh, is quite good and uh, quite representative. So this is what this is what we see in our uh, in our um, studies now. Um, for yes, there will be a new, uh, there will be a next uh, next aircraft. When uh, when when we will start? I mean, it depends on a lot of things. Uh, and you have to mention we we are you know we just started with flight testing our alpha so we have to really learn more about those mm -hmm. um, aircraft uh, we have to go to limits we have to to learn um, what is a what is a proper specification for all the systems and therefore you need to gather all the data so it makes no sense to start now again a project without gathering learning um, from from what we have uh, but yes we we have a lot of studies running uh, and hopefully, um, you know, one of them will uh, will succeed and will will will, it, will be the successor of uh, of our alpha. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So thanks all for joining. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, special thanks for Tom getting up early for us because we are sitting all in Europe. He's sitting in California. But uh, and one wish for everybody. Yeah. Uh, 
stay healthy and uh, perhaps we'll have another discussion very soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Willie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.